Welcome to Christ Gospel Church of St. Petersburg, Florida, where Bishop Preston D. H. Leonard is our international presiding bishop and Dr. Tony Young Jr. is our pastor. We are the church where everyone is welcome, where the Bible is the guide and the Holy Ghost is the director. We are delighted you decided to join us today and pray you will be richly blessed by the praise and worship and by the rhema word from the Lord. Please share this link with your family and friends as we prepare to go into our service. May God bless you. Praise the Lord Christ Gospel Church family and friends. We are so blessed that you have decided to join us again for another virtual Bible study here at Christ Gospel Church. First, we will worship the Lord in song, after which we have a dynamic lesson just for you. You don't want to miss it. Again, we say thank you for joining us. Good evening. I just want you to be encouraged tonight to know that the Lord draws near to those who are brokenhearted and that you can call out to him to let him know that you need him right now and he will answer.
Hello and welcome to another Christ Gospel Church virtual Bible study. Hi, I'm Dr. Young and on behalf of Bishop Leonard and all of us, we are delighted that you have joined us again for another portion of the Word of God. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. Are you rejoicing tonight? And be glad in it. We do not take it lightly that you have taken your precious time to sup with us from the Word of God. Well, let's go ahead and let's open up in prayer so we can get right into our lesson. Father, we bless you. We honor your name. Lord, we come to you and we just salute you. We recognize you, we praise you, we worship you for just being God all by yourself. And Lord, we thank you that we have a privilege again to come and to study your word together. Lead this Bible study, fill our hearts that we will know you in a greater way. And God will say thank you for these and all blessings in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. We have such a, a great time studying the Word of God, and today we are continuing a lesson that uh, we started last week. It's a study on a man called Job. I appreciate those of you who were with us last time, and thank you for those who are joining us this time. You know, last time we covered four important P's. That's right, P as in Papa. Four important P's of Job's life in our introduction in Job chapter 1 through verse 8. If you missed that lesson, don't panic. You can go back and watch that lesson on YouTube. You see, it's important to get all parts of this lesson so that you will know how to be victorious over the enemy rather than becoming a victim of our own circumstances. So if you're ready, let's go to work in the word of God. Tonight, I want to start with the overview of Job, you know, just to give you a really good recap. I gave you some last week, but I'm going to give you a little bit more detail tonight. Job is believed to be, the book of Job is believed to be one of the first books written in the 66 books, or you can say it's the oldest book written in the Bible. It was written somewhere approximately 1800 to 2000 BC. And although the author is not known, many believe it was Moses or Job or Elihu, the mystery man who shows up in Job chapter 32. But we don't need to know who wrote it. It is a book in the 66 uh, canon that we use and we know that Job lived in Oz. We know that Job had 10 children, seven sons, and three beautiful daughters. Job had a huge estate, which was large enough where each of his 10 children had their own house and their own land. It kind of reminds you of the Ponderosa, doesn't it? A huge plot of land where different kids live in their own section. Now, we also know that Job lived near a wilderness because in verse 19, a strong wind comes across from the wilderness where his eldest son lived and it destroys his house and the lives of Job's children. Yes, Job lives near a desert. He, he lives in a dry place, but, but he still somehow the richest man, the greatest man in the East. Now, I have a few questions. This is Bible study. How do you have more than enough while living in a desert and dry place? How do you have so many bountiful blessings living around so much poverty? How do you survive the storms of life when many folk around you are drowning in defeat, depression, and devastation. What well, Job opens our eyes and it teaches us all how we can survive the storm, how we can uh, have two pennies in our pocket and still worship God. Oh, I said last time that every, 
Every rich person is not a devil and every poor person is not a saint. I believe God is looking for balance in our lives. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we move into our lesson. Now, Job is a book that does not promote riches. I hear a lot of teaching from pastors and teachers about Job being a, a book on riches, how you uh, can get all of this stuff and still serve God. Yes, that's possible, but that is more of an outlier uh, versus the norm. Uh, the Bible gives us very strict warnings about riches. See, riches is a God. Mammon is a God. You know, Jesus, you know, says uh, in the book, you know, you cannot serve God and mammon, money, because both God and money is considered gods that vie for our worship. Amen. But Job it isn't a book that promotes riches. Rather, it promotes righteousness. Yes, although Job is a very wealthy man, notice how the story starts with four important things about Job. We went here last time, but this is a quick review. One, he was blameless. How do you remember that? Job was blameless. He, that means he was perfect and mature. He, he stood firm in his horizontal relationships with man. Huh? Nobody could find any fault with him. He was blameless. Then it says, Job was upright. In other words, he, he was honest. Yes, he was truthful and he stood firm in his vertical relationship with God. When you take the horizontal relationship with man and the vertical with God, you end up with the cross of Calvary. Yes, number three, Job feared God. In other words, he showed reverence for God. He respected and he obeyed God. And then finally, it says, Job shunned evil. That means he avoided evil. He ignored and stayed away from evil. You should know if you have lived in this uh, this world, any length of time, that evil is everywhere. Evil is is in my neighborhood. It's it's in your neighborhood. It's it's in the White House. It's in the the outhouse. It's in the crack house. Evil is all around us. But Job made it his business to stay away from evil. What about you? Are you staying away from evil, or are you inviting it closer to where you live? Now, this is actually a interesting account that a person can be possessionally wealthy and still serve God well. That just amazed me that a rich man, one of the richest men in the East, could have all of that and still not allow himself to be possessed by the God of mammon. Unfortunately, many today have sold their relational birthright for a bowl of money, a bowl of power and position. Brothers and sisters, I, I want to start tonight by answering some questions, and then I want to end with the final three Ps that we started last week. Is that all right? Oh, we're going to have a great time in the word of God. I want you to get your Bibles. I want you to get your notes. I want you to just get ready to have a great time in the word of God tonight. First question, was Job a real person? Hmm. Was Job a real per person? I hear questions all the time, and you may have heard this question. A lot of people believe that Job was not a real person, but some emblematic, symbolic story or myth in the Bible. But let's be clear, Job was a real person. How do you know Dr. Young? Because he's referred to in other places in the Bible. See, when God, he was speaking through the prophet Ezekiel, in Ezekiel uh, 14, I believe, verses 14 through 20, I want to make sure you have the text, the reference so you can go back and validate this. 
Listen to what God said. God says, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were there, their righteousness would save no one but themselves. Wow. Now, let me ask you this. Do you believe Noah was a real person? Check. Yes. Do you believe Daniel was a real person? Yes. Then why would God list Noah, Daniel, and Job together if Job was not real? Hmm. It's a good point. So we know that Noah and Daniel were real men in biblical history, and so was Job. Also, James refers to Job in his book, James chapter 5, verse 11, when he says, Ye have heard of the patience of Job. A lot of times we quote that. Oh, you need the patience of Job. Well, he's referring to a real person who went through a lot of trials and tests and tribulations, but he had patience. Yes, Job was a real person and he lived and died here on the earth. Next question. When did Job live? Now, it's clear that Job lived prior to the giving of the law. I need you to stay with me tonight because we do know that Moses came under the dispensation of law and, and we're living under grace. But before that, uh, Abraham lived under the dispensation of promise. And so it's important to know uh, how and when these events, these different dispensations occurred in time. So Job lived prior to the giving of the law, since the book of Job makes no mention of the tabernacle or the temple, priests, or giving of the law to the children of Israel. Actually, the children of Israel are not even mentioned because they were not even born yet. Now, if Job lives prior to the law, he should have lived sometime around 2200 and 2000 BC, making him a contemporary or living at the same time as Abraham, Lot, and Isaac. Another clue that places Job in the time prior to Moses is the fact that, listen to this, Job gave his daughters an inheritance among their brothers. Look at Job 42 and verse 15. In all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. You see, under the Mosaic law, a father passed his inheritance to his sons only, unless he had no sons. You can find that those, those laws in Numbers 27, 1 through 11, and also uh, Numbers 36, verses 1 through 13. Now, Job is already established as being a righteous and upright man. Is that what the Bible says? Now, if he was righteous and upright, he would have followed all of the laws in obedience to God. But because the law had not yet been given, Job wasn't required to follow them. So therefore, he had to live pre-dispensation of the law. Amen? Let me see if I can answer a few more questions real quick. How old was Job when he got sick? And how old was Job when he died? Now, these are great questions, and I get these questions all the time from folks who just love information, love history, and this is why I want to take some time tonight to try to feed some of the sheep who just want this information. The longevity of Job's life is a clue that he lived around the time of the patriots, uh, at the time that people tend to live around 200 years old. Now, if you back up to Adam, you know, Adam lived to be 930, Bethuselah, the oldest man, 969. That was long before these guys. Now, if we kind of uh, move forward, 
Terah, that's Abraham's father, he lived to be 205 years old. Huh? Terah, Abraham's dad, lived to be 205. And Abraham himself lived to be how old? Come on, talk to me. That's right, 175 years old. And Abraham's son Isaac lived to be 180 years old. So you can see the span here, 175, 205-ish, doing that disposition. And usually the humans, uh, those that lived when Adam, they lived 900, 800, 700. Then after the flood, it started to drastically decrease. You see, the human lifespans gradually decreased until by the time of the judges in the Bible, the human lifespan were typically under 100 years old. Moses himself, who comes later on after Job, the Bible says Moses died a very old man and he lived 120 years old. So let's get back to Job. Many biblical scholars believe that Job was around 70 years old when he first appears in Job chapter 1. This is when things were going well. He had a good job. He had lots of possessions, lots of animals, 10 children. He was blessed. He was rich and all of that. He was about 70 years old. Now, if you look at Job uh, 42, verses 16 and 17, it says that after this, after this, meaning after Job went through all of his testing, and we fast forward to uh, the last chapter of Job. After all of that, Job lived another 140 years and he saw his sons and his grandsons even up to four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. Now let's put all this together. If Job is approximately 70 years old when he uh, appears in the Bible and he goes through all of these tests and all of the trouble. And after his test is over, he lives another 140 years or 140 years. If you add 70 and 40, you come up with 210 years. This is right spot on with the age of Abraham's dad, 205, give or take five years. So it's important to understand that the Bible makes sense and we have to make sense of what the Bible is telling us. Amen. Praise his holy name. I hope this is being helpful. Now let's jump into the last three P's if we can do that. Yes. Number five, if you can remember uh, the ones that we talked about last week, we don't have time to go back, but we're going to just continue on. Number five, Job's protection. Job was protection. How did Job survive in a wilderness, in a dry place, all those years? Well, let's jump into the word of God. And we're going to uh, start here at Job chapter 1, verse 9. And let's read maybe down to verse 12 and see where that takes us. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not placed a hedge around him? around his household, and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. In other words, don't touch him. You can't touch him without my permission. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now it's interesting that Satan goes to heaven to give an account of his whereabouts, his deeds on the earth, and God recommends Job to Satan. Now, in all of that conversation, Satan says something that may shock many Christians. And I need you to hear this because Satan don't want you to hear what I'm about to say. Verse 11 says, listen to this. Satan asked God, 
He says, stretch out your hand, God, and you touch all that Job has. Now, why would a devil, if he is so powerful that people, you know, the devil has some power. God has given him limited power, but he's no match for God. But why would some big monster that we have made him out to be say, I don't even have the power, God, to even lay one fingernail on your child. He says, you stretch out your hand and you touch all that Job has. Oh, that's good news, brother and sister, that whenever something happens, and we're going to talk about um, two basic ways trouble can show up in our lives. And, and you want to make sure you write this down because sometimes we're giving Satan credit for things that God is doing. And we're giving God credit for things that Satan is doing. And in between all of that, sometimes we are really to blame at some of the stuff that's going on in our lives. So let's talk about the two basic ways trouble can show up in our lives. So you ready for this? One is trials and tribulations, and the other is a test. Trials and tribulations and a test. Oh, this is good. So trials and tribulations are those things that typically occur as consequences to our choices. In other words, when, when I eat too much sugar, fat, or salt, guess what? Those are consequences what are the consequences? Well, it could be diabetes, it could be high blood pressure, it could be poor health, it could be a, a lack of breath. It could be all kinds of stuff. And I can suffer. Now, listen, did the devil make me eat all that sugar, salt and fat? Come on, be honest. Don't blame stuff on the devil. He he ain't got that kind of power over you. The devil did not make you eat half of that chocolate cake. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. No, he did not make you drive down to Krispy Kreme and eat a whole dozen of them hot, glazy, sweet donuts. Oh, God, would you please save me right now from myself? No, you ate those dozen all by yourself. And guess what? When we make poor choices, there are consequences. And a lot of times we get in the prayer line and we ask people to pray for us when we are if, uh, inflicting our own selves with consequences. You know, when a person lies and cheat and they get caught. So, oh, pray for me. I'm going through. Yeah, you're going through because of your choices. And yes, we feel bad for you. But we also got to recognize where this is coming from. There was a man who would call in sick every Friday. I don't know what it was, if it was the, the Friday flu or what it was, but it seemed like every Friday he, he was sick. You know, he called in, I told him, well, I don't feel good today. And you know what? After a while, after a while, he was let go. He wasn't let go because he was sick, but he was let go because he started a negative trend when, when we needed people there on the busiest day, the busiest day of the week, he was a no-show. And on top of that, he ran out of sick time and he had to face the consequences of his poor choices. Now, the other way that we experience uh, trouble is through tests, and this is what Job is experiencing in the story. God allows Satan to test Job. Now listen to me clearly. I don't want you to uh, misquote what I'm about to say. The Bible says Job was perfect and upright. He feared God. He stayed away from evil. He was blameless. And even God himself told Satan, there is no other man like him on the earth. This is God bragging on him. So brother and sister, Job did nothing per se to warrant any of these consequences because of his choices. Job worshiped, he sacrificed, he gave God his due. 
He loved God. And to the outsider, the pain looks the same. They really don't know if these are tribulations because of a person's poor choices or is it really a test because God is testing that person to grow into a deeper relationship with God. I'm so glad to know that as a child of God, Satan cannot do anything to me without God's permission. You see, if things are happening to me and God has not given Satan permission to touch me or to touch my possession, then I need to look at myself. I need to change the way I'm living. I need to change my diet. I need to start exercising, get off them chocolate cakes and donuts and sweet potato pies. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Somebody pray for me right now. Put your hand right there and say, God, touch Dr. Young. Amen. That spirit that spirit of sugar is coming all over him right now. Bless the name of the Lord. Now listen, after God gives Satan permission to touch Job, he, he immediately goes to work to do three things, to steal, to kill, and destroy. That leads us to number six, Job's persecution. Job's persecution, his loss and his pain. Can we look at verses 13? I'm going to go down to verse 19. Y'all stay with me. Now, that was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their older brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabians raided them and took them away, indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and all the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, another also came and said, The Chadians formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Wow, I can't imagine losing a son or a daughter, but to lose 10 children and your possessions all in one day, I can't fathom it. I just cannot imagine going to a funeral and there are 10 caskets stretched out in front of the church. But can I tell you this? We may not ex ever experience this level of devastation, but all of us will be tested. Can you say that with me? All of us will be tested. If you want to make it personal, say, I am going to be tested. You know, in order to get promoted to the next grade or go to the next level or dimension in life, we must be tested. Somebody say, I am going to be tested. Let's look at one final P tonight, and then I'm going to let you go tonight. Number seven is Job's prayer. Job's prayer, his worship and his devotion to God. Let's look at verses 20 through 22. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, my God, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. My God, hallelujah. You know, I love the fact that Job prayed and worshiped God when things were going well. He, he got up and he worshiped. 
He offered sacrifices for his children regularly. So listen, it's so important for us to store up our worship, store up our prayer life when things are going well. So it was easier. It wasn't easy, but it was easier for him to pray and worship God when things went south. What about you? Do you wait until your life falls apart to start praying and worshiping God? Or are you one of the believers that when things are great, when you just got a promotion, you break God off the first fruit? Oh, when things are great and your children are are just doing well, do you worship God and offer sacrifices to him? Are you storing up a bank account of prayer? and worship so when you need it, it'll be there for you. I believe Job was blameless and upright because he wasn't possessed by his riches. Let me say that again. I believe Job was blameless and upright because he was not possessed by his possessions. He knew that where his treasure is, there his heart is also. So losing his camel, his sheep, his oxen, his donkeys, his servant, and even his children, it was so difficult for him. But he knew that these were earthly possessions. These were earthly treasures. And this is why, this is why, listen to me, this is why Job could say with tears in his eyes, naked I came. From my mother's womb. And naked shall I return there. The Lord has gave. And the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Can I paraphrase that in my closing? In other words, Job said, none of this stuff was ever really mine. It was all on loan to me because this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. So anything that I get here in the in the earth is really not mine. It's just temporary. So he said, so God gave it to me. He loaned it to me for a period. And then he comes back and he takes it back. Oh, bless the name. Now, why was he blessing God? Not for the death of 10 children. No, 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 no. He wasn't blessing God because he lost all of that. No, he was blessing God because, listen, God loved him enough to loan it to him long enough where he can be a blessing to somebody else. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You see, I love Job because he's thinking about the years that God gave it to him and that he enjoyed those things. The years that he enjoyed his children, he didn't think about the death of them, but he thanked God for the time he had with them. He didn't thank God because he lost and got robbed and burglarized, but he he thanked God for all the years he had the camel, the ox, the donkeys, the servants. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Job didn't blame anybody. He didn't even blame God or Satan. But we know Satan went and it was the permission from God to allow Satan to do this. But Job didn't blame a soul. And after all of this, this is the way I'm going to end this Bible study. And this is the way Job chapter 1 ends. Listen to verse 22. In all this... I have to just park there because there's a lot that Job went through. I'm just going to let that marinate in all of this. Some of you got some of this going on in your life. You can't even tell all the stuff, all the problems, all the hurt, all the pain that you're going through. But in all of this, I want you to put your problems and all your troubles where it says this. I'm thinking about some of the pain that I've been through, some of the sickness I've been through, some of the disappointments I've had. It says, in all this, Job 
did not sin. Listen. Wow. In all of this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. I want to pray. If you got a request, put it in the window, but I just feel the, the burden of prayer. God, we thank you for this servant Job who teaches us that when we complain over a headache or when we complain over a loss, when we complain over not being treated fairly, it cannot be compared to all that Job went through. But Lord, when he said, in all of this, he didn't sin and he didn't charge you. Lord, we repent right now for our ignorance, for our complacency. And God, I repent right now as a leader, as a pastor, for Lord, not standing firm and using Job as a benchmark to teach me how to know that I can still stay true to you, whether I have a pocket full of money or whether I am sitting outside the city scraping my boils with broken glass. I can still love you even when my friends come and lie on me. So God, we all repent for not being grateful and not standing firm on your word. Thank you for this man called Job and the lessons, the life lessons that he continues to teach us every day. And God, I pray over the requests that are coming in right now that you would just honor your word and teach us to be more grateful and teach us to be blameless. Show us, Lord, how we can be upright, how we can fear you and stay away from evil. And Lord, we'll say thank you for these and all blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. I tell you, I just, I got a little fool there at the end. Because when you think about what God has done in your life, you can only say, God, I thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope that you've been blessed. Amen. Come back again uh, next week. We got another powerful lesson for you. And we just thank you. Please stay tuned for our church announcements. Until next time, this is Dr. Young saying, be blessed. God reigns in majesty. He reigns with authority. Can you put your hands together? Come on, bless the name of the Lord all over this room. Here we go. My God reigns in majesty. He reigns with authority. It's real simple. He reigns, Almighty One. He reigns, God's only Son. Can you say, My God reigns in majesty? Now say it. He reigns with authority. Now lift it. He reigns, Almighty One. Shout, He reigns, God's only Son. Hero!